Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the session, the first session of the ITRC Community of Practice on Using a Public Health Approach in Communities to Build Population Level Mental Wellness and Resilience for what I call the Climate Ecosystem Biodiversity Catastrophe. I'll explain that in a second if you haven't heard that. Um, there's going to be, there's 100 people that were actually admitted. Not all will show up today, but we're going to have a whole lot more, obviously, that will uh, uh, join us here in a few minutes. Before we get going, I just want to, and I'm going to do this in this session only, I won't do it every other session, but I really want to thank all of the co-sponsors of the Community of Practice, starting off with the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice, upper right-hand, left-hand corner of the screen. Uh, Jesse Kohler, the Executive Director, is going to be a key person in this session, and you'll hear from him in a second. The American Public Health Association, who is offering CE credits, but there's a slight glitch in that that I'll describe in a second. The Alliance for Nurses for Healthy Environments, the National Prevention Science Coalition to Improve Lives, the Scottish Community Development Center, the Children's Environmental Health Network, the Climate Psych Psychiatry Alliance, the Community Resilience Initiative in Walla Walla, Washington, the North Carolina Smart Start Healthy and Resilient Communities Initiative, the Visible Hands Collaborative, Peace for Tarpon, Tarpon Springs, Florida, the Trauma Resource Institute, the National Association of Social Workers, the Climate Psychology Alliance North America, the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, the Climate Psychology Alliance in the UK, uh, the College of Behavioral Health Leadership, uh, Racines de Bienestar, which works with Latinos uh, uh, in Portland, Oregon, the Climate Mental Health Network, and Trauma-Informed Oregon. I want to thank all of our co-sponsors and many of you that are with us today are members of the, one of those groups. Uh, so I thank you all for, for, for uh, co-sponsoring and for being here. Um, so today's agenda, we're going to we're gonna start with some logistics. We're all going to do this once today. We won't do it during the rest of the sessions. Uh, we're then going to do brief introductions so you can get to know everybody uh, slowly but surely. Uh, then we're going to share uh, some simple resilience skills during the day to plant seeds about how you can build and sustain your own resilience and help others do the same. Uh, but most of the day is then going to be on providing an overview of what the, the community practice is going to focus on, uh, why we need this kind of community-led initiative, uh, and what is a public health approach to mental wellness and transformation resilience and the core principles. Before we get into anything more for the logistics, I'd like to do a very, very brief set of uh, staff uh, introductions. And also, please keep yourselves on mute, uh, if you would. Uh, Jesse, you want to pop on and just uh, introduce yourself real quick? Howdy, everyone. Pulling you back down here. I am Jesse Kohler. I am the Executive Director of the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice, or CTIP. I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm thrilled to be here with all of you today. Great. Christy, you want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Christy, she, her pronouns, and I'm from Trauma from Oregon, um, located at Portland State University, and I'm going to be supporting y'all with chat and on the forum. So great to have you guys today. Great. And Christy likes to jog while we're doing this, so you have to keep up with her. Uh, <laughs> and Christian, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, good morning, folks. My name is Christian. He, him, pronouns calling in from Portland, Oregon, um, also with Trauma-Informed Oregon, and looking forward to supporting folks in the chat today. Great. I can hear somebody talking. If you could put yourself on mute, please do that. Uh, and that's the second line. Please keep yourself on mute at all times so there's no background noise as we can hear now. So here's the flow of the community of practice. Um, uh, the first three sessions are going to focus on how to organize and facilitate a community-led resilience building initiatives. The next five sessions are going to focus on the different uh, core areas that these initiatives need to focus on to build population-level mental wellness and transformation resilience for the climate emergency in specific. And the last two are going to focus on problem solving and learning, just chance to really get into it with each other. And then there are three uh, special sessions that we'll talk about soon, but they are totally voluntary. They're going to be on Thursdays, uh, and they are in the document that you got describing it. Um, session documents, um, you will receive documents prior to each session, and they are going to also be posted on the Community Practice uh, Climate Forum, which is on the CTIP website. Hopefully, you'll all sign up for that. I'll talk about in a second. 
There, we're not going to take a break during the 90 minute sessions. So take one as you need it, but please do not take a break during breakout rooms. We want you to really meet and talk with other people. Um, uh, as I just said, please set up an account if you haven't already. Last I saw it was about a third of the 100 people that are participants had signed up already. Uh, but please set up an account with the CTIP forum, uh, the community practice forum on the CTIP websites. That's where we'll post all the slides, recordings, materials, and you will be able to talk with others. There's been a snafu in the uh, APAHA credit process. They had a problem approving new uh, credit system, and we just heard about this yesterday. Um, so they cannot offer CE credits for the first three community practice sessions, but we were told it's very likely they'll be able to offer them for all of those offered in March and April. And if they do that, that means that those who want them can get up to 10 CE credits. Uh, when they are available, uh, and if you want CE credits, you're going to need to e complete an evaluation that American Public Health Association will send you about each session. We will also occasionally send you a, an evaluation about how the community practice sessions are going for our own use, which is different than the APHA continuing ed credit evaluation. Uh, and it's just to help us learn how to improve the sessions. And then finally, there's going to be weekly homework assignments that shouldn't take you a whole lot of time, but we want to apply what we what are shared here. Um, so please be prepared to do that work. Most of the time, it won't take you more than an hour, if that. But then to report back on the outcomes of uh, the homework, questions you might have, struggles you had trying to do it, uh, and what you still want to know. And we'll get a homework assignment today also. So here's the key that I want to emphasize throughout the uh, entire community practice, uh, and that is that community is medicine. Throughout human history, our ability to band together has always been key to responding creatively and adapting to and solving complex problems. And by working at the community level, we can do this again now. So now it won't move. There we go. So always remember, and this is the message for the community practice, if trauma can be passed down through generations, then so can healing and transformational resilience. This is the mission that we're trying to focus on. So I want to just start with a resilience pause. And then after we do this, we'll have you do the first breakout session so you can start to meet people. And a resilience pause means that you're just taking time out of your day to focus on your own resilience. And then as we go on through the community practice, we'll teach you how to teach these to others. But so why don't we start by just taking a moment to use what I call the skylight method to notice what you are experiencing right now in your body, your mind, and your emotions. And what this means is imagine you're on the roof of a building that has a skylight and you're looking down through it at yourself. Uh, so you've got sort of an objective view of yourself and just notice what's happening into that person or your body right now. Do you feel tension in certain muscles, pain? Do you feel pleasant sensations? Are you warm? Are you hot? Are you chilly? Just notice whatever's going on there without trying to change anything. There's no right or wrong, you're just noticing. And then notice what's happening in your mind. Are you thinking about the past, something you didn't do before you got on the webinar, got on the session? Are you thinking about the future? Uh, are you mind racing? Just notice what's going on again without trying to change anything. There's no right or wrong. And then notice your emotions. Are you happy, sad, revved up, you know, uh, sort of depressed a little bit? Whatever's going on, just take a moment and imagine there's a skylight above you. You're looking down objectively at yourself and just notice what's happening right now, just for a second in your body, your mind, and your emotions. And 
And as you do that, you might just take a moment to breathe consciously. Uh, when you inhale, you could, you don't have to, but you could say soft. And when you exhale, you could say breath. So soft as she comes in and breath as your breath leaves your body. Again, no right or wrong way to do it. No expectations. You're not trying to change anything. Just try to notice. Take a moment to just breathe and notice your breath. And as you do that, you might just use the skylight method again. Notice what's going on within you just as you breathe in your body, mind, and emotions. Just take a moment just to notice as you breathe. And with that, you can just come back to the session. Um, this is a simple skill you can use at any time, uh, no matter what you're doing. Just take a few moments to use the skylight method and just to notice your breathing. So with that, let's do the first round of introductions with breakout rooms. We're gonna divide you into groups of uh, three to four people. Just introduce yourself briefly, where you live, your organization you work with, the type of work you do, share your favorite dessert. Uh, and then also, if you can, let the name and location of the neighborhood or community in which you apply what you learn in the community practice. And if you did interview anybody, uh, 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 from your community as suggested in the acceptance email for the community practice. How did it go? And did you learn anything? You might not have done that, so don't worry about it. But just get to know each other. You'll have 10 minutes with three or, three or four people just to, uh, to get to know each other a bit, and we'll come back and do another one later. So with that, Jesse is going to divide you into groups, and you'll see these instructions posted in chat. See you in 10 minutes. Just to open the breakout. Arms. So I assume everybody's back. I hope you had a first good round of, of uh, just getting to meet some people. Uh, and again, there's a hundred people that's been uh, that'll be involved with the community practice. So I guess about seventy are here today uh, already. Um, and so you'll get to meet others. Uh, but we can't have one big group meeting because that's a, a lot of people in one one meeting. So. Uh, a group dialogue. But if there's anything that came up in your discussions, any particular issues, questions, uh, something that stood out that was really exciting, please feel free to post that in chat. Uh, that would be great. So I'm going to provide now a background <clears throat> of why we're holding this community practice and get into the, some of the core principles. This is the only time I'll go into something this long. The rest of the sessions will be much more interactive. But I want to make sure we're all on the same page with why we're here, what we're trying to do. And the starting point is to realize that we all know, uh, most of you are in the mental health, human services, or climate, or other professions, and know that st toxic stresses are just epidemic all over the world today. Uh, insufficient wages, high poverty, uh, social isolation and loneliness. Uh, you can see all the ones, intergenerational, and ongoing racism, and other systemic oppressions, many other issues are uh, occurring. Uh, they're different in different uh, cities and different states, different provinces, different countries, but they're, they're all there. And to these now, we have to add the accelerating stresses generated by the climate emergency. Every small increase in global temperatures creates more harm. We have to understand that. But last week, in fact, it was announced that global temperatures have now breached the 2.7 degree Fahrenheit, 1.5 degree uh, Celsius threshold for an entire year. Um, this is what we were trying to avoid to keep temperatures. Uh, even the Paris Agreement tried to keep temperatures to 2.7 degree Fahrenheit, 1.5 degree Celsius or close to it. Uh, but what we, we've we already breached it and uh, it really pushes us closer to possibly irreversible impacts. Many climate scientists will say, we're already at, we're already there, we're already uh, past some of the tipping points, but others say not. Uh, but it's not just the atmospheric 
uh, climate issues and the temperatures that it also is true that under current emission paths, we're going to see collapses of ecosystems and catastrophic biodiversity loss this decade, sometime before the 2030s, starting in the tropical oceans and in the, in the Amazon and then spreading northward. And they are connected. The temperature increase causes uh, collapses of ecosystems and biodiversity loss. And that also feeds back to impact temperatures. Uh, because they're interconnected. So the reality is we're actually in the early stages of a rapidly accelerating climate ecosystem biodiversity catastrophe that is already and will increasingly affect every aspect of society. And many of you hopefully have seen the webinars we've done in the past and read about this, so bear with me. I'm just going to walk through it again. Again, it's not just an atmospheric climate issue. It's connected to the ecological systems and to the biodiversity. And I call it a catastrophe, not to catastrophize or just build it up more than it is, although it's a pretty big event, uh, but to use the term uh, as it's used in disaster sociology. In disaster sociology, emergencies are short-term events caused usually by a single factor that have a limited geographic scope and social consequences. A disaster, uh, in, in contrast, has a much longer time frame, larger impacts, but they're still characterized as single events that end and give people time to recover. A catastrophe, however, is defined as an event that has multiple interacting impacts that are very substantial and widespread that build on themselves and are cumulative and often have very unforeseen surprising consequences. So consequently, they're far more complex, far more uh, complicated and severe and prolonged than an emergency or disasters. And most important, you do, importantly, you don't respond to a catastrophe in the same way you do uh, or try to manage a catastrophe in the same way you do a, an emergency or disaster because they are more complicated, severe, widespread, cumulative, and prolonged. But what we've been mostly doing so far, if we're doing anything at all, uh, to prepare people for, for what's coming is to use sort of pr the approaches we've used in the past to prepare for mostly emergencies and disasters, that is single events that end and give people time to recover. But the climate ecosystem biodiversity catastrophe is clearly a catastrophe that requires a very different form of response. And if we leave this unaddressed, if we do not respond differently, we're going to see an epidemic of mental health and psychosocial problems or traumas around the world. So what we really need to do is proactively build population level transformational resilience. I'll define this in a few minutes, not just treat individuals who show symptoms uh, uh, of pathology after they're traumatized or react to the next disaster, or hope that enhancing external physical resilience is going to be sufficient. All that will remain important, but we've got to do much more. So here are uh, six ways in which the climate ecosystem biodiversity catastrophe really affects mental health and well-being. And they're from two different articles, one by uh, Dr. Helen Berry, who was one of the very first researchers in this field. Uh, she's in Australia. Um, and by uh, a colleague of mine, Ernie Nimi, who runs Natural E-Tourist Economics. There are the direct effects on mental health caused by punishing weather events, such as extreme heat, and other disasters that have been linked with increased distress across the entire population. You can get the research in Ellen Berry's uh, article and some others. Uh, there are indirect effects on mental health produced by worrying, anxiety, fear, anger, hopelessness about what the future is going to bring. That's the eco-anxiety and climate grief uh, uh, fields. But that's also the psychological distress caused by physical injuries, such as inhaling wildfire generated smoke. That is um, uh, even an article today I saw research came out and said it's really causing health problems, as well as the long term illnesses, disabilities and other chronic health problems that can produce depression and hopelessness and more. In addition, there are the emotional and physical distresses caused by both subtle and overt changes in daily life, a forced change in lifestyle, such as what we're seeing in many, many countries, disrupted sleep patterns caused by hot and weather, or people being, being forced to move out of their homes or communities due to climate impacts. And then there are widespread 
hardships, uh, tra traumas and stresses generated by the destabilization of the ecological, social, built, economic, and geopolitical systems people rely on for food, water, jobs, income, shelter, safety, security, and other basic survival needs. Often people don't connect that with the climate ecosystem biodiversity connected with them. With food shortages, something's going on, I don't have it, or we're short of water, or jobs are being lost, they can't make the connection, but that's the, that's the overriding driver. And then there's also anguish and distress caused by climate pollution related deaths uh, that are estimated to be about 4 million uh, since 20, 2000 in the World Economic Forum just a while back predicted it to be 45 million people by 2050, but all of the research on this have acknowledged that they know those are vast underestimates. It's much higher than that. They just don't have a way of calculating it that well. So this is a population level problem. Everyone is going to be affected. Um, but in the near term, in different times, ways and magnitudes, those at greater risk are the people you see, the populations you see there. BIPOC residents, low-income populations, migrants, ethnic minorities, single women, uh, young children, people living alone, the elderly, people with insecure housing or who live in high-risk zones or who have pre-existing conditions and first responders, and actually many of us in the mental health field. So climate impacts are aggravating existing inequalities and injustices and adding new ones that create even greater impacts on these groups. Um, yet at the same time, we need to be aware that if we only focus on the vulnerable, the most vulnerable, this allows wealthier people to think that their resources and capacities and skills make them immune from the impacts. So they don't need to cut the emissions. This is just a problem for the vulnerable. Uh, so let's give them more money or do some, you know, throw some, some resources that way and we don't have to change anything in which case the climate emergency just gets worse and worse. And also just focusing on the vulnerable, I tend, can uh, run the risk of isolating those groups even more from others. So we have to be very careful as to how we approach this issue. But if we leave this issue unaddressed, we're going to see an epidemic of individual community societal distresses and traumas. And again, I think many of you have already seen this or read this, but bear with me. Um, uh, emotion, a psychological, emotional, and spiritual distress it's just a normal, understandable uh, uh, response to things that seem difficult to cope with uh, or witnessing events that are harmful or fantasizing about the future. Again, that's what climate anxiety or climate grief is about. And many of you, especially in the mental health field, know what individual trauma is. It's, a, a, and I like this definition by Kai Erickson, it's a blow to the psyche that breaks through one's defenses with such brute, brute force that one cannot react to it effectively. And as so often happens in catastrophes, people withdraw in themselves, they feel numb, afraid, vulnerable, and very alone. But it goes beyond individual traumas and distresses. What we're seeing around the world already is community traumas. Um, and we don't really understand that as well, but this is an event or a series of events that creates a basic blow to the tissue of social life that damages the bonds people have that attach them together and impairs their prevailing sense of community. It's a gradual realization that the community no longer exists as an effective form of support. And therefore, part of the self disappears. Again, that's Kai Erickson's definition, really good. Um, and community trauma, by the way, can include people in a specific geographic area, but it also can include people, uh, online communities and religious communities and others that just share uh, their, their own sense of identity. And then there's societal trauma, which goes beyond a specific geographic area or group with a shared identity to affect entire cultures or nations or all of humanity. The pandemic is a classic societal trauma. People everywhere were affected. Uh, and if we don't get out front of this issue, the climate ecosystem biodiversity catastrophe is gonna be the greatest societal trauma modern society has ever experienced. Um, it's also important to know that uh, the traumas go well beyond individual reactions because they can activate unhealthy and harmful group behaviors and often do. Uh, moderate stresses, and we need to understand this, can activate pro-social behaviors, the tend and befriend reactions 
that creates the community cohesion phase of a disaster that we'll talk about in a few minutes here. But when severe toxic stresses or acute traumas occur, it can affect and, and affect entire groups, communities, et cetera. They activate everyone's fear and alarm center of their brain, the amygdala of the brain, and they can sideline everyone's executive center, the prefrontal cortex to try to think rationally. And it create, it puts everyone in this protective reaction uh, phase that can feed off each other and lead to reduced assistance to others, decreased group cooperation, and increased interpersonal aggression and violence. Uh, and or it can also cause people to be easily influenced by us versus them narratives. We're the good people, they're the bad people, or they're the ones causing our problems into conspiracy theories and they, to follow demagogues who say, we're the people that can solve the problem. They're your problem. We're going to get them, et cetera, et cetera, all that stuff. So when you experience, when you see this kind of uh, large scale uh, stresses and traumas, uh, you really run the group of the risk of these kind of reactions. And we're seeing that it really can unravel families, communities, uh, in all of societies. And we really have to be, we see that already in many places. We have to be very careful about that. The other thing it can do is actually the, the mental health, the, uh, uh, the psychological, emotional, and social behavioral issues can affect our physical health. There's an old saying by from Brock Chisholm, the first uh, director, director general of the World Health uh, Organization, that there's no uh, physical health without mental health. Oops. Um, the comorbidity, between mental and physical health issues are very common, but not very well understood between in mental health profession or the physical health profession. Uh, adverse social, psychological, and emotional conditions often aggravate existing or directly produce new physical health problems, cancers, heart diseases, diabetes, and others. And physical health problems can come back and generate mental health issues. So if we leave these issues unaddressed, those pervasive traumas, we're gonna see even more physical health problems and cost of the associated with them. And finally, uh, these unaddressed traumas that are out there already and it will continue to grow, really activate fight or flight protective reactions. Again, they're, rea they're resulting from more of the emotional brain, the limbic system, the fear and alarm center of the brain. And they are also contributing to op opposition to climate policies and climate practices. Uh, and that's because when people are frightened and they're in this fight or flight re reaction, uh, they tend to withdraw into a self-protective survival mode. And they oppose major changes like uh, a shift to in the kind of vehicles you can buy or costs rising because of uh, not using fossil fuels, et cetera. My experience out in the field, and I think if you think about it a lot, uh, also you might find that many, much of the opposition to climate policies and practices is not so much ultimately an issue of ideology or political affiliation, but of things gone wrong in people's lives. Uh, and they're reacting to that. Um, uh, and that tells you something about how we can help. So, and this is occurring just when the solutions we need for the climate ecosystem biodiversity catastrophe require constant learning, growth, adaptation, and innovation. So we're retreating, we're protecting ourselves, just when we need to really be innovating. So let's just take a short resilience pause again, just to sort of let you sort of sit with what you just heard uh, and sort of just sort of let it digest a little bit. And you just might wanna take a, a few moments just to use the skylight method. Imagine you're looking down at yourself uh, through a skylight uh, and, uh, uh, and notice what's happening now in your body, in your mind or in your emotion, no right or wrong, no right way to do it. Just take a moment to notice what's happening. And then if you're willing, if you'd like to just Take a moment to just breathe again. And you could say soft when you inhale and breath when you exhale, but just sort of pay attention to your breathing 
as you practice that skylight method, again, no right or wrong way to do it, no expectation of anything changing, just noticing. And then come back to the session. So we now understand background, very brief background. Again, most of you have heard all this, I think, because you've been involved with the webinar, you read, you looked at it, the material uh, before this session, but uh, what the issue is, what we're trying to get out front of. And here's one of the struggles we're having in how to deal with this issue. And that is that most mental health issues in Western nations have been privatized. What did I mean by that? That the dominant par paradigm is that the individual alone is, a res is responsible for their psychological, emotional, and, be and behavioral struggles. Uh, and the correct approach, consequently, is to treat those individuals mostly one at a time after they experience symptoms. But if this makes sense, if this is correct, how is it possible that mental health and psychosocial problems have now grown to levels that are now epidemic? Uh, are there simply more uh, genetic problems growing? Because we think that much of the mental health issues are genetic. Is it because alcohol and drugs are more available now? Uh, they've been available for a long time. Why have we reached epidemic levels? Something else is obviously going on. But the existing individualized paradigm about these issues and the funding systems, the social, the, the support, the other systems that support it often restrict the discourse to only what fits into the notion that it's the individual alone is responsible for their mental health issues. And I think as we go through the community practice, I hope everyone understands that it. it's clearly partly individual issues, no, no question, but much more is going on and that's what we have to work with at the in, in the community level. But one consequence of this individualized uh, uh, approach is what I, you could call a whack-a-mole systems that we have. Uh, our mental health and human systems, uh, human service systems mostly react to the next crisis and disasters, and mostly by treating individuals one at a time after they show symptoms. And then the next uh, crisis arrives and they have to react to that. That's what we keep doing. Uh, somebody did a great article about this not too long ago. Um, uh, and so but this means that our current systems cannot address the scale or scope of today's mental health and psychosocial problems. And I'll explain why in a second. And there's really no chance that they're really the only piece of the puzzle to address the widespread trauma speeding our way due to climate ecosystem biodiversity crisis. So why is this? Even if there were vastly more trained providers, there's never gonna be close to enough uh, mental health providers to assist all of the people who are traumatized. Up to 50% of the people who could use assistance won't engage in mental health services. And this again is based on good research because of fears of being stigmatized if others find out, high cost or no insurance, religious concern and other reasons. And many black and indigenous people of color, BIPOCs, stay away due to injustices embedded in the system, historic and ongoing injustices uh, or inadequacies in the Western medical model, their, their belief about that. And just as important or even more importantly is that they mostly assist individuals only after they show symptoms and they don't prevent the occurrence of widespread mental health issues. So individual mental health services, many of you I think are in that field, they're gonna remain very important. And we're gonna talk more about that as the session, as the community practice goes on. But just doing more of the same is clearly not the solution. We have to do more. And in fact, the what we're seeing around the world and certainly in North America, but in many other places is that uh, the climate ecosystem biodiversity related traumas, the mental health and psychosocial issues, as well as many others, result from interacting individual family, social, economic, built and ecological factors. This is the social ecological model. Again, you can find good research on it at the bottom. You can see that yes, somebody's mental health uh, is affected by their knowledge, school, their childhood experiences, their biology, their genetics, but that's influenced by the interpersonal uh, situation that they find themselves in, their friends, families, neighbors, social work, uh, social networks, and the social norms and values that they have. 
And that is all influenced by the communities in which they live, the conditions of their neighborhoods, the workplaces, schools, voluntary and civic group, religious groups, et cetera. All of that is definitely influenced by policies and institutions, power relationships, um, uh, and the type of services that are available. And all of that, we live within all of it, which is the environment in which we live, the conditions of our food and water and open space, green spaces, the physical built environment, uh, housing, transportation, et cetera, economic and ecological systems. There's an old Lakota nation saying that our health and well being are the result of complex, the complex consequences of all our relations. And that's really the key. We have to focus on all of our relations uh, to address these issues. And to address all of our relations, we've got to get out of our professional and organizational silos and think systemically and respond holistically. But if we take this approach, what we've seen in, in organizations and community groups that are doing this, uh, we can activate deep-seated transformational changes. So what do we mean by that? What does transformational resilience mean, how we define it? When suffering is caused by previously unseen external forces that have no endpoint, no resolution, or simple cure, that is the climate ecosystem biodiversity catastrophe, the priority has to be to help everyone develop the capacity to buffer themselves from and push back against the stressors and use those adversities as catalysts to learn and adapt and find constructive new sources of meaning, purpose, courage, and hope in life. So another way to think about it and the way we define it and I define it is help everyone strengthen their capacity for presencing and purposing. Presencing is self-regulation and co-regulation to help us calm the body, mind, emotions, and behaviors in the midst of adversities. That's what those resilience pauses are, uh, are beginning to do or hopefully doing. But also purposing, which is adversity-based growth, post-traumatic growth. That is to use adversities to, as a catalyst to keep learning and adapting to find new sources of meaning, purpose, courage, and hope in life. When we started the ITRC 2013, a bunch of us got together and talked about what we really need to do is use the climate uh, catastrophe, climate adversities as catalysts to really, uh, as post-traumatic growth catalysts to really find new meaning, purpose, and hope. But we thought post-traumatic growth, adversity-based growth was too wonky for the general public. So we came up with transformational resilience. That's what, what that definition meant. But we have found, and I think if you think in your life, when you do this and people you know do this, the combination of this really can rebuild faith in the future. And the capacity for transformation resilience requires that we also address all of our relations, all of these issues that affect us, these multi-systemic factors. Um, so we have to think and, and, and respond at the population level. And this requires actively engaging neighborhoods and communities. Why do we wanna work at the neighborhood and community level? Uh, because they are the most common interface between all those multi-systemic factors that influence mental health and transformation resilience. Neighborhoods and communities influence social values and norms, personal and family behaviors, habits and practices, safety and security that people feel, housing, transportation, open spaces, and other key aspects of the built physical environment. The education is almost always shaped by the community and the neighborhoods. Jobs, incomes, and economic opportunities, healthy and just ecological conditions, all of those are shaped by and influenced by neighborhoods and communities. And all of that influences our ability to come together, learn, adapt, and create solutions to today's issues. Uh, but the, the ability to sort of work at through all of our relations also was reaffirmed by a statement by the noted clinical psychologist, Dr. George Albee, who once said, no epidemic has ever been resolved by paying attention to the treatment of, an, of the affected individual. Now, this is a clinical psychologist, not a physical health person. He wasn't talking about COVID. He was talking about mental health and human service issues. Uh, and we still shouldn't just focus on the individual alone. And this underscores the need to expand our approach beyond just individual uh, services to prioritize a public health approach to mental wellness and transformational resilience. So what does this mean? 
Uh, a public health approach to mental wellness and transformation resilience takes a population level approach, just like any public health approach does. And not merely focusing on individuals with symptoms of pathology or high risk groups, though they must be included using proportionate universalism and life course approaches. We'll talk about what those two mean uh, as we go on in the community of practice. But our mantra has got to be leave no one behind. Everybody is going to be involved with this. A public health approach to mental wellness and transformation resilience focuses on preventing problems before they emerge, just like any public health approach does, not merely reacting to or treating them after they emerge. And many of the, the programs we've seen and initiatives we've seen integrate group and community-minded healing methods, often run by peers, into the prevention strategy. So we always have to remember that prevention is the cure. And a public health approach to mental wellness and resilience achieves this by strengthening protective factors, social support networks, resilience skills, habits, local resources and services, et cetera, that build and sustain healthy thinking and behavior. Again, not just fixing deficits or treating individuals with symptoms of pathology. So we must build strength, social connections and resources. This is very different than what we've been taught to do, most of us. And research shows that we can build uh, mental wellness and resilience. We can do this work and that the most effective way is to establish the horizontal social infrastructure in communities, connections across the community, not the top-down kind of work that many of us have been involved with, uh, but that horizontal social infrastructure that can be called a resilience coordinating network. Uh, that, that many, There's many variations of that name. Each community calls it whatever they want. But the idea is that it engages a broad, diverse array of local grassroots, neighborhood, voluntary leaders, civic groups, nonprofit, private, and public organizations who come together and plan and implement multi-systemic strategies, meaning strategies to address all of those issues we've talked about, all those stressors uh, that strengthen uh, uh, the um, capacity for mental wellness and resilience among the entire population. So here's an example of a uh, 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 what we call a, a, a resilience coordinating network. It's really well-coordinated decentralization using a ring team and a hub or a hub and spoke approach. So inside you see the uh, a group uh, of neighborhood leaders starting at the top, private sector, civic leaders, youth leaders, public sector, mental health, nonprofit, faith leaders. These are just examples. There's many other, uh, each, each group is different. Each network is different. Uh, and they might elect co-chairs and executive committee, and if they have the funding, they hire staff. But outside of that, there's all these groups, uh, these what we call innovation teams, resilience innovation teams that are working with different populations. So up in the right-hand corner, upper right-hand, you see there might be one that's working with neighborhood groups, then one working with the private sector, one group trying to build resilience within a uh, youth, uh, then one working with educational systems, the private sec um, public sector organizations, human services, climate, uh, and others, uh, they're doing their own work. They're developing their own strategies to build resilience, mental wellness resilience within the populations they work with, but they come back and they stay coordinated with this broader group. They share their strategies. They get feedback on it. I always give the example of one I, down in California that, that they were as a, a very strong emphasis on working with public education. And they came back to the steering committee and said, but you know, about 10% of the kids in our, in our county don't, uh, they're going getting homeschooled. Have you thought about how to engage them? Oh, no, we hadn't really done that. So they put together an effort to, to be able to, to work with, uh, to reach out to them. So that's that kind of thing. And also this kind of approach really helps coordinate fundraising efforts. So we've got to collaborate in new and expanded ways to respond to the climate ecosystem biodiversity catastrophe and the ring team uh, approach, the well-coordinated decentralization that you could call the resilience coordinating network is really one of the key ways to do that. Why do we need that? Why is this really important? Here are the six common phases of a disaster. Um, on the far left, you see we often have a warning, but sometimes not, of uh, a disaster coming our way. Sometimes an earthquake can happen without any warning. Sometimes you get a day or two, but the climate emergency, we've had actually over a hundred years of, of warning and certainly the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, but then you get an impact uh, and that impact can, can traumatize 20% or 40% of the people that are directly impacted and 10 to 20% of others, uh, the emergency responders, people who know somebody who's impacted, et cetera. 
And then it goes into the heroic phase. The impacts are happening and people who don't know people, don't know others, step forward and put their lives on the line to help others uh, during and right after. Uh, and then it usually goes into the community cohesion phase that I talked about. It's also called the honeymoon phase where community members come together. Uh, they don't know each other. Many times they wouldn't even like working with this other person that they've never met, but they come together. They provide food, shelter, water, social support, emotional support, et cetera. Uh, and that really is vital. And you see that often. Um, but then the community cohesion phase ends after it could be a month, could be a few days, uh, because people have to go back and, and organize their own lives. Uh, so that ends. And that's when the disillusion phase takes over. And that can last months to years. And that's where most of the mental health and psychosocial problems emerge uh, because people are on their own, uh, et cetera. Some people see at the bottom remain uh, dysregulated for a long time, but most eventually start to recover, assuming there's no other disaster or no other relentless stresses that they experience. And eventually, if they don't, they bounce back. The climate emergency is going to make that more and more and more difficult. So why do we need this uh, resilience coordinating network? Because the climate ecosystem biodiversity catastrophe is going to continue and actually accelerate for decades. Most mental health and psychosocial problems surface months or later after those direct impacts occur in that disillusionment phase. So we need to build the horizontal social infrastructure in neighbors, neighborhoods and communities to sustain the community cohesion phase over the long term. That's what we're really trying to do, not let people go out on their own uh, and experience those issues. So just very quickly, I'm going to go through five other things, and then we're going to do another breakout session. We, Our research, we kicked off a, an extensive research project in, uh, that we thought was going to be six months, and it turned out to be about two and a half years, uh, looking all over the world. How Has anybody got ideas of how to prevent and heal mental health and psychosocial problems generated by widespread relentless adversities. And we found out that there is. It's the public health approach. At least that's what we call it in the Western um, world. Uh, but one of the key, uh, five, we found five key areas that are going to be specifically needed for the climate emergency. And by far the most important is to build strong and weak social connections throughout the community. By strong, I mean people who you, friends, families, and neighbors who you share your life with in some ways. By weak, it means people who you don't share personal things with, but you're still connected with in some ways. And you could also call it bonding, bridging, and linking social support networks. Building social connections is vital to address the toxic social isolation and loneliness that is generating profound mental health problems today due to, due to uh, the internet, social media, but the way our jobs are, are operating, et cetera. But they're also those connections are also far more important than first responders during the first three to five days and often much larger, longer of many disasters. And social connections are especially important in a crisis, which we now have, because they provide the emotional support and practical support needed uh, for health and resilience. Uh, and when people uh, uh, engage in this kind of work, some people find meaning and purpose in their lives by assisting others in some way. So building those social connections often gives people a new sense of meaning and purpose and hope by going out and assisting others. The second uh, that we, the second core foundational area we focused was to ensure a just transition by actively engaging residents and creating zero emission, climate resilient, physical built, economic and ecological conditions, um, locally owned and operated businesses, healthy, uh, and safe public spaces, parks, et cetera, equitable transportation, healthy forest and ecological systems, healthy and ample housing, et cetera. This is critical. We don't usually think of this as our job in the mental health and human services world, but it is. It's directly connected. We've got to avoid that siloing because unhealthy local conditions create mental health and psychosocial problems. But we have seen in many, many community organizations doing this work, uh, have found that active engagement in creating healthier uh, local conditions from the bottom up enhances hope, which builds resilience uh, and adapt uh, adaptability. Uh, you're going to hear from the Neighborhood Resilience Project uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that'll go right into this work. They actually see 
people uh, increasing their sense of hope and therefore mental health uh, by engaging them in this kind of work. Uh, and at the same time, while integrating this work happens, what you also integrate external physical resilience with the human social, physical, uh, and emotional resilience. What we've mostly focused on is trying to harden physical infrastructure in our communities. That's called climate adaptation in many cases. And that's usually completely disconnected from this work, but it has to be connected. Um, and the same point, reducing local emissions, strengthening physical adaptation and uh, in other ways, also when you engage residents of that, you create pressure for political pressure for change. So I wanna just emphasize here that there is no community resilience without human, social, psychological, and emotional resilience. We can't just focus on the external physical. So actions to reduce emissions, <clears throat> regenerate, restore ecosystems, strengthen physical resilience, um, that's gonna have limited effects unless they are fully integrated into efforts to build population level, mental wellness, and transformational resilience. <clears throat> and at the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, disaster preparedness and response and disaster mental health and other human services are going to be much more effective when they're integrated into these community-led resilience building initiatives. So the third aspect we found, the third foundational area is to really build universal literacy about mental health and transformational resilience. This feeds off of health literacy. Uh, and what we the research shows that people are very, uh, health literacy and Literacy about mental wellness and liter and resilience are very low, but you want to build that by helping everyone become trauma and resilience informed, helping everyone understand how trauma and toxic stress can affect their mind, body, and emotions and behaviors, and then learn presencing and purposing skills, those self-regulation and adversity-based growth skills. This helps people understand what is happening within them and around them, which can normalize their struggles, uh, and reduce their fears of being stigmatized if other fi people find out they're struggling with this. And therefore, they won't stigmatize others as much because they know, oh, they're experiencing something like I did. And while it also builds the knowledge and skills needed to prevent and heal their own mental health struggles, uh, and it can motivate some people to find new meaning, purpose, and hope in life by helping others become trauma and resilience in form. We find that to be the case often. The fourth area is to help residents regularly engage in specific practices that enhance mental wellness and transformation resilience, laughing off and practicing forgiveness. You'll hear some really fun examples of how this can be done in communities, uh, being grateful. Uh, active engagement in these activities releases trauma from the nervous system, which helps prevent uh, mental health issues and, and heal them. Uh, while it also builds the social connections and offers experiences that can create emotional states that bring people meaning uh, in life and motivate some people to get involved to find new meaning and purpose in their life by helping others laugh often or practice forgiveness or be grateful, et cetera. And finally, the fifth area we found in each, we're going to go through each of these in much more depth in one, uh, in a special uh, uh, CO, uh, community practice session. Uh, the, uh, the fifth is to establish mostly peer-led group and community-minded opportunities to heal trauma. Even when people are uh, engaged in these other activities, many times because of the climate emergency getting worse, they will be traumatized. So we really have to offer these on an ongoing basis, healing circles, somatic healing, expressive therapies, nature-based healing, spiritual healing, et cetera. Uh, and again, these healing methods normalize struggles and help people eliminate fears of being stigmatized while allowing people to hear how other people uh, view the struggles and how they're approaching healing. Uh, and it builds the emotional safety nets that, that people need to release their trauma and heal uh, and remain uh, resilient and adaptable while also motivating some people to find new meaning and purpose in their lives by being trained as peer facilitators for these efforts. These five areas are all interactive. Each community group, each community network starts at a different, where they feel makes sense in their community and does it in their own unique way. So it's, I just read them linearly, but it's not really that way. That's not really how it works. 
Um, and there's a whole bunch of examples of these kind of resilience coordinating networks going on in the U.S. And you're going to hear from many leaders in them. In fact, some of you are, are involved right now uh, from the North Carolina Resilient, Healthy and Resilient Communities Initiative uh, to Virginia's trauma-informed community networks, Peace for Tarpon, uh, the Rhode Island Health Equity Zones, and many others. And there's a whole bunch of international initiatives also. One of the best is Abundant Community Edmonton, up in uh, Edmonton, Canada, but also community-based approaches to mental health and psychosocial support, a definition by the Interagency Standing Committee. A community-based MH, MHPSS approach puts individuals, communities, and social systems at the center of the intervention, uh, intervention at all phases of the response. Only a few of these initiatives describe their work as a public health approach, but they're all doing that using that approach in many ways, their own unique approach. Each is unique. There is no one size fits all approach. None addresses all the five core foundational areas and only a few are explicitly focused on the climate emergency, but they show how community is medicine. And so if we can get those not focused on the climate emergency to expand to address it, and if we can organize thousands of new community initiatives around uh, the world, we can build universal capacity for transformation resilience and get out front of the climate ecosystem biodiversity crisis. Um, let's take one quick second to do one more resilience pause just to, and then we're gonna go breakout room, uh, just to sort of take in what you've just heard uh, and calm yourself. Just take a moment to practice the skylight method to notice what you're experiencing now in your body, mind, and emotions. Let what you heard just settle in. What's going on within you? And then let's take a slightly different approach to a breath-based resilience skills called present moment breathing. Uh, and no matter where you are or what you're doing, you can always do this. And that is simply to focus your attention on the sounds and sensations of your breath. So just pay attention to your breath and try to uh, feel the expansion and contraction of your rib cage. Or follow the sensations of air going through your nose, down your throat, into your lungs, and out again. Just sort of follow the sensations of your breath. And if your mind wanders into something else, just bring it back to your breath and hear it now. Just, just, just do that for a few moments. you can use the skylight method just to notice what's happening within you if you want to. And come back. Come back to the session. And let's do another round of breakouts. Uh, in this case, introduce yourself, discuss um, how you can share what you just heard with people already involved with the local resilience network that you want to share this information work, or maybe there's with people who are not involved with the resilience network that you would like to get involved with and form a resilience network. People you want to share this with. How could you talk about this? Sort of bring to mind what you just heard and you won't remember it all. But we're going to do 10 minute breakout and Jesse's going to divide you into groups of three or four again, and uh, just have a conversation for a few minutes. So we'll see you in 10 minutes. Opening up the breakout rooms now, one quick note before I do is just that it's now 10 minutes and then there will only be 30 seconds before you all jump back in. But looking forward to seeing you all in about 10 minutes. I Welcome back everyone. Um, well, let's, we're going to do now some question and answer. Um, if you, if anything stood out for you, particular questions or particular issues that came up or points, why don't you post them in chat and Christian's going to read them out and I'll try to answer, but and anybody, any of the other staff can answer too. So uh, I hope you did have a good session. I hope it was interesting. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, Christian, is there anything that pops up yet? Because there is a question that we could answer already. Jesse posed a question uh, when we were getting ready here for to open it back up about how would you summarize this information in a simple elevator speech? And for those of you who don't know an elevator speech, it means the image is you get on an elevator and you got to go up one floor or two floors with somebody you want to really share something with. So you got the, the very brief time. How would you describe this work to somebody uh, using an elevator speech. And that is your homework assignment, by the way, to develop a homework, uh, uh, elevator speech uh, uh, about this that you can share with others. But my reaction to that, each person's elevator speech is going to be different because you're talking to different people in different contexts, to different demographic situations, et cetera. Um, so you have to tailor it to who you're talking to and what you'd like What's, what's the purpose of talking about this and sharing it with the person? Is it to get them involved with something or is it just to share what you're doing, et cetera? But a very short uh, way of saying this, at least my way of saying it is, you know, we're experiencing a whole lot of stress now. Everybody experiences it. Uh, and we have to come together in our communities and in our neighborhoods and in our groups to help everyone learn skills to deal with that stress in a very healthy way that helps people then also find ways to address, creatively address those challenges that are creating those stresses. Uh, so that's just one very short way, that's a short elevator speech. You can go longer than that. Um, uh, with people who are talking, interested in the climate emergency, you can talk about the climate emergency. And for those who you think could care less or might turn them off, you don't have to talk about it. You can just talk about how you're feeling in life and stresses or whatever it might be. So you've got to sort of know your audience a little bit. And the best way to do that is talk to them, ask them about themselves and create a relationship, then tailor your uh, elevator speech to that. So that's a short form. Uh, Christian, any questions, pop issues, points that showed up? Yeah, we have uh, Mary's interested in um, exploring how to bring up these ideas without political backlash in the community you live in. Great question. <clears throat> sort of just what we were talking about, um, that you don't have to uh, understand the, the political dynamics. That's what you, the first thing is understand that. And so you don't have to address climate change per se. Um, you can just say, how do you feel? Do you feel stressed? I'm, I've been really stressed. I've been nervous about some of these issues. And what I found is the best way I deal with it is to get together with friends uh, and talk it through and, and to do projects together. So that's sort of the way you can do it. You just, you make it personal and you talk about practical issues that people are experiencing in their lives, in their communities. Um, and that usually can avoid uh, the political uh, fallout and political risks. Um, make it personal, talk about what's happening in people's lives. Christian, is there any others? Oh, right. We have, um, we're looking to, uh, what are good strategies to stay ahead and go beyond the possible demise of democracy in the United States? Well, that's another 14 year community of practice, I think, <laughs> we have to take on. That's a pretty big question. Um, I, well, the only thing I can say to that is that uh, the more we can connect with people on issues they're struggling with, they're concerned about, the issues they care about in the community, the better chance there is to avoid or overcome political polarization. Uh, I don't think we're as polarized as it appears. I think the media and particular uh, organizations are trying to create that polarization. Um, and then people fall into that, like we talked about, that uh, when people are stressed, they can have those uh, adverse group reactions. Uh, but I think if you just connect with people personally, talk about issues that are relevant, that they care about in their lives, see how, share how you deal with it, et cetera, avoiding the political part of it, that often helps you overcome those kind of issues. Not always, but often. All right. We had a group discussing about how to knit all of the people working towards these issues in the community. Is it a neighborhood approach? Uh, good question. Um, it can be a neighborhood approach and in a larger civic area, a, a larger uh, 
uh, metropolitan area, uh, that the neighborhood approach is best. Uh, but in a smaller community, it can be the whole community. It really, you have to decide what the best approach is, the best size and how to do that. And it's to getting, you're, we're going to talk about this next week, getting friends together with colleagues, getting a core group together to start to plan this out. They have to decide what the best approach is. You might start at the community level, at the neighborhood level, uh, two or three or four neighborhoods or a neighborhood region, and then expand. Or they might decide, no, this is what we want to stay with right here. Uh, in that level. So it's really up to the the people involved um, and, and there's no one size fits all approach. Everybody has to do it, uh, have to decide on their own. So with that, there's other questions that they might be in chat, but let's, I wanna just take a sidebar here and turn it back to Christian to talk very briefly about how you, the, the instructions for creating the uh, climate forum uh, on the CTIP uh, uh, website so all of you can get uh, your your profile up there and, and get involved. Christian, you wanna do that real quickly? I can go for it. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> Christy, Christy. We switched it up on you. Um, but Bob, Chris, Bob and everyone, Christian did make a video tutorial for the Safe Tip Forum for how to set up your profile and what to do. So that video uh, will be coming to you. We can email it to you guys um, in case you haven't done it already. But in the meantime, I just wanted to give us a quick walkthrough of the CTIP Forum. So, oh, so Bob, I'm going to share screen. Do you mind? I'm going to, oh, which will yep. stop you from sharing. Okay. Let's see. So there we go. So this is the Climate COP Forum on CTIP's website. And I just wanted to give us a quick overview just to orient you guys to some just key pointers. So when you go on it, initially you might be on all posts. And this is great if you want to know like what's happening most recent for the most current posts, but it can be a bit overwhelming. As you can see, there are a lot of different posts that we've already put on here. To help organize the posts, you can go under categories over here at the top. When you click categories, it kind of organizes them into, into categories. So first we have general discussion. This is a great place for you if you want to uh, reply or add a new post. That's just general Q&A, things going on. If we go back, we also have posts or categories by region. So if you want to connect with someone in your area who might be at the COP as well, um, this is a great opportunity for a little bit of networking and learning who else in this COP is working roughly in your region who you guys might be able to collaborate with. So I am in the Pacific Northwest in the United States. If I click over here, there are some three basic posts already listed just to help you get the conversation started. But we strongly encourage you if you want to connect with other folks within the COP, because it's hard to do so when there's so many of us, you're welcome to look at this uh, either by region in these categories. We also have folks, um, if you want to go the other way for urban, suburban and rural communities, because we recognize those can have different dynamics as well. So you're welcome to do both. In addition, underneath those regional categories, we also have week one, week two, et cetera. And that'll have all the information you um, are seeing today. So for week one, we later on this week are going to create a post that includes the slides from today, the recording of this, notes, that's like kind of a summary of the discussion we had, and any resources specific to this week's discussion. This will also include if you ask some questions in chat and we didn't get to it, we'll respond to your questions in here as well. We'll also include the homework for this here, and we ask uh, that you review it for the homework and ask any questions, but you're welcome to either post your homework here or going back to categories, ask questions about your homework within your specific region as well. You can also make your profile if you click over here. My, oh, gotta think about it, my profile. And you can make this public or private. Christian's video shows you how to do that. But the great thing about this is you can add your email as well, or if you want to be contacted in your bio. And that way other folks within the COP know like, hey, this person wants to be contacted in case you want to network within your region as well. 
Right. But if Thank you, you have <laughs> any questions, Christian has a video that we'll be sending out later. And always feel free to email Christian or myself if you have any technical difficulties. Great. Thank you. Okay. We're just going to take um, uh, one last second. So here is uh, your homework uh, based on this uh, session is first take a resilience pause daily, at least in practice of breath, breath breath-based resilience skills. And if you're willing, teach it to somebody else, a family member, a friend, a colleague, teach one of those skills to somebody else. And it's always best way to learn it is to try to teach it, try to get it out of your uh, your system, to your mouth and share that with others and you bumble around. Second, prepare an elevator to speech to discuss how you can expand an existing resilience coordinating network to address the uh, climate ecosystem biodiversity uh, catastrophe or talk with others to form a new one. So develop a short elevator speech describing what you learned today. Share the elevator speech with one or two people, get some feedback and improve it. And then post the final elevator speech before next week's community uh, practice uh, and be prepared to share your talking points next week. We're going to get together next Tuesday. February 20th. And then from that point forward, you won't hear as much from me. I'll talk, I'll share every session, but you're going to hear from uh, practitioners in the field from this point forward. And the focus is then going to be how do we organize and facilitate and staff uh, and fund these community-based resilience coordinating networks. And again, there'll be two presenters. So with that, I wish you all a very good week. Thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you all uh, in a week from now. Thank you kindly. Take care. Bye-bye.